Hi, so my name is Himan Shityagi. As we discussed in the beginning, a part of this course will be covered by Aditya and the other part will be covered by me. So this uh, from this week onwards for the next uh, two weeks, I'll be presenting the lectures. Just before I begin, uh, let me quickly try to review what Aditya was doing the last time. So Aditya was talking about this uh, IID random variables, not just independent random variables x1 to xn okay they are all independent and and he was talking about this function f of x1 to xn and he was talking about the concentration properties of this function and he related those things to something called the bounded difference property What was this bounded difference property? It said that if you take this function f and fix all the coordinates, let's say x1 to x i minus 1, and just allow just one coordinate to change, the ith coordinate, and see how much can this function change when you modify just this one coordinate. So these are two different y and y prime. I fixed all the other coordinates and just modified this one guy. And sub say you take max over all y and y prime. And let's say you also take max over all of the remaining coordinates. So you take x1 to x i minus 1 and x i plus 1 to x n. Suppose, so this is my function f. Suppose this function cannot change by more than ci. Here this i denotes the ith coordinate. And this holds true for all i's between 1 and n. So you have one ci for each coordinate. So then we say that this function satisfies this bounded difference property okay, with constants c1 to cn. So with constant c1 to Cn. And what Aditya showed was something called the Diarmid inequality, which says that if you have any function, so let f satisfy, I'll just abbreviate this property above as C1 to Cn bounded difference property. then for independent actually perhaps used a milder assumption there but let's say independent x1 to xn if you look at the probability that uh, let, me let me bring in a notation so for independent x1 to xn the random variable so the random variable of interest to us is this random variable z which is simply the f of x1 to xn so this z satisfies the following uh, the following concentration bar It satisfies this uh, met diarmid's inequality it is met diarmid's inequality it says that the probability that this random variable z exceeds its expected value by more than t that probability is less than or equal to e to the power minus t square by 2 summation i equal to 1 to n c i square. So this inequality uh, basically is a generalization of Hoftink's inequality where we had 
a similar bound holding for sum of iid random sum of independent random variables with each of which was bounded and now just from the sum of independent random variables we can go to any function of those random variables and we get a similar concentration bound and this concentration bound if you uh, i am assuming you're using this terminology it's a sub gaussian concentration bound and this guy here is the the variance parameter for the sub gaussian concentration bound okay so it's as if this random variable z is a Gaussian with variance given by this guy. Okay, that's what this bound says. So you might as well just uh, imagine it heuristically as a Gaussian. That's what this McDiarmid inequality says. So this was a concentration bound, uh, and today what we would like to talk about is the variance of this random variable. So we just uh, we have shown something stronger. We have shown a concentration around uh, its mean with this variance parameter. But what about the variance of this random variable? And that's what we will bound today. So it's a slight deviation from this concentration uh, inequality topic that you have been seeing. It's now we are suddenly talking about variance of z. But uh, that's as we will see that firstly, this variance is indeed related to concentration bounds. And secondly, this is of independent interest. You may in some applications be interested in bounding the variance. And to bound this variance, what we can use is sort of a cousin of McDiarmid's inequality. And this is called the Afrenstein inequality. That's what we will see today, the Afrenstein inequality. So we can bound, can bound the variance using Afrenstein. inequality okay, that's what we will do now bounding the variance of these functions uh, which satisfy the boundary difference property using Afrenstein inequality okay that's that's what we will do to, in today's lecture so let me start with that I'll the first part which is this lecture <laughs> I, I'll, I'll cover two lectures this week in the first lecture I'll derive the Afrenstein inequality okay so uh, yeah, that's the derivation of Afrenstein inequality so I'll state the form at the end let's go over the derivation of that inequality itself how, how can we bound the variance of this random variable z as we have seen in the past that one very basic result about sum of independent random variables is that its variance is sum of the variance of the individual parts. In fact, we don't even need independence for this result to hold. We only need those random variables to be uncorrelated. And so the question now is, can we decompose this random variable z, that's the function of x1 to xn, into various uncorrelated components? And that's what we will do. And here is a trick to do that. Let zi be the expected value of your z given x1 to xi okay that's what zi is it's the expected value given x1 to xi then uh, if you if you look at and let's let's put in some convention here z of 0 is just the expected value of z it's without conditioning on anything then we can express this z as z0 actually we can express this difference z minus the expected value of z this is exactly equal to z minus expected value z0 by the way this z also is equal to z of n so if you condition all the guys you get z right 
So we are doing this telescopic something. So this is Zn minus Z0. So I'll add and subtract things Zn minus Zn minus 1 plus Zn minus 1 minus Zn minus 2 plus Zn minus 2 and blah 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 plus minus you will keep on doing and then minus Z0. So what have I done here? It looks like a very simple trick. So I do summation i equal to 1 to n z of i minus z of i minus 1 and this guy here this guy here I will define this guy to be delta i so what can we say about this delta i so that's the that's that's something we would like to see what is so special about this delta i an important thing about this delta i and this is the claim we have here claim Note that this delta is a random variable by the way and this, uh, z, this z minus expected value of z is also a random variable and this this increment when you condition on the first i coordinates and uh, minus conditioning on the first i minus 1 coordinate those increments are also random variables uh, if you don't remember this just uh, it should take just one second to recall that this conditional expectations are actually random variables and they are functions of what you are conditioning on so they are, this is a random variable which is a function of x1 to xi. Okay, delta i therefore also, this, so this guy is a function of x1 to xi, this guy is a function of x1 to xi minus 1. Therefore the overall delta i becomes a function of x1 to xi. Okay, so that's just something about delta i claim this random variables delta i are zero mean and uncorrelated so these random variables delta i for i equal to 1 to n actually i equal to 0 to i equal to 1 to n are zero mean so their expected value is zero and they are uncorrelated what is uncorrelated this just means that the expected value of delta i delta j is equal to zero if i is not equal to j so they are uncorrelated okay How do we prove this? So this proof is actually an exercise just in conditional expectation. But let's do it for completeness. Let's uh, let's do expected value of delta i delta j for distinct i and j. This is equal to the expected value of expected value of z given x1 to x i. times expected value of z given x1 to x j and without loss of generality we can assume that i is less than j So th this has this j is conditioning on more random variables than this guy. Ah, sorry, should have. Yeah, yeah I should be a little bit more careful here. Uh, So this is expected value of z i minus z i minus 1, z i minus z i minus 1 minus z j minus z j minus. That's what delta i is. And this guy equals to the expected value of x 
expected value of z given x1 to xi. I'll just abbreviate this by x1, this superscript i. This says x1 to xi. This is the vector x1 to xi. Just a shorthand. This is my shorthand from here on. So this is now expected value of this given this. And then you have expected value of um, so this times the expected value of z given xj minus the expected value of z given zj minus one. So note that all these terms here, because j is greater than i, are functions of xj, all these terms here. So I'll use this formula for expectation, uh, where I can first, so, so just I'll write this formula here, expected value of any random variable x is equal to expected value of expected value of x given any random variable y. Okay, that's a formula which you should be familiar with. So I'll apply this formula and the random variable y I'll choose is x1 to xj. And then everything inside will be a function of x1 to xj. x1 to xj minus 1. So this guy here becomes expected value of expected value given x1 to j minus 1 okay of what function of this this guy here remember this guy is just delta i delta j okay so that's what i will do so expected value i'm just using this formula now when you condition on j minus 1 this guy, the first term here becomes a constant. The second term here becomes a constant because you're conditioning on more than i random variables, more than or equal to i random variables. J minus one is greater than or equal to i. So these two terms are constant. Uh, this term is also a constant. This is just J minus one. So this just depends on, so it's a function of J minus one. So it becomes a constant. The only random variable that you are left with here is just this guy. Okay. So this, expectation here is equal to expected value of z given xi because it becomes a constant when you condition on j minus 1 into expected value of z given xi minus 1 into expected value now this is the term which doesn't remain a constant so it becomes expected value of z given xj given xj minus 1 minus expected value of z given xj minus 1 because this is again a function so so the only thing which changes when you do this expectation this is a constant this is a constant this is a constant the only thing is that you have you take this further conditional expectation so do you know what is this conditional expectation here you are conditioning on more and you are averaging over less. So this is this is expected value of z given a b given uh, expected, va uh, expected value of z given a b the conditional expectation given a. That's just the term outside that will remain. So this is this is exactly equal to this part here is exactly equal to expected value of z given x j minus 1. Which is the same as this. So this whole term becomes zero and therefore this is just zero. So these things are indeed uncorrelated. This becomes zero. Okay. And let me zoom out so that you can see the whole proof. Let's see, 175. Right? So this thing is just zero. And similarly, what we will see is that the expected value of each of this delta is also zero. Yes. 
let's see that further expected value of any of this delta i is expected value it's a, it's a very similar proof i'll just write it of z given xi minus expected value of z given xi minus 1 and now what i'll do again is i'll take conditional expectation given xi minus 1 of this term so that's can always do that and now what we notice is when we take this conditional expectation this thing since you have fixed xi minus 1 this is a function only of xi minus 1 so this is a constant so this is expected value of expected value of xi given xi minus 1 minus this thing which is just a constant and this term as we have seen before is equal to expected value of z given xi minus 1 which is equal to this and therefore this whole thing becomes so this is 0 this expected value of 0 so this becomes 0 so indeed xi is a 0 mean and they are uncorrelated so this is very nice then this decomposition is actually very nice if you have this random variable z which is a function of independent random variable you can decompose it into independent components like this you can decompose into zero mean and uncorrelated components like this right that's that's what um, that's what we are saying here and uh, Okay, so this is the first claim. We have been able to decompose this difference into uncorrelated components. And so we continue. Therefore, our goal, remember, was to bound the variance of z. Variance of this random variable z is equal to variance of summation i equal to 1 to n delta i, where each of this delta i is, uh, is uncorrelated and zero mean. And this variance, yeah, so maybe one step I'll just write. This is just for concreteness. Uh, this is true. This is always true. Okay. And this guy is summation i equal to 1 to n delta i. That's something we just checked where each delta is 0 mean and uh, uncorrelated. And so therefore, since they are uncorrelated, the variance is additive. And, it, and since this delta i's are zero mean, this sum, this variance is just expected value of delta i square. Okay. So we'll examine this, this guy now, this expected value of delta i square. E each of these terms somehow controls fluctuation in one direction. That's very concrete here, this one direction and we want to see how much that fluctuation can be. So next we look at this yellow term here, the one I've circled here, and this guy here, this term here is just the expected value of delta i square. So remember what was delta i? Delta y, i was expected value of z given x i minus the expected value of z given x i minus one whole square that's what this this term is this is this term here um, and we would like to simplify this further so once again we need to use another property of conditional expectations we have already used one uh, we have already used this very interesting property of conditional expectation which i'm assuming all of you are aware of that the conditional expectation of x is expected value of conditional expectation of x given y so this is a function of y in this expectation of this function is equal to expected value of x. Now we need another property of conditional expectation and uh, I'll just write it in this specific context. So the claim here is that if you look at the second guy here, this one here, this, 
this is the conditional expectation of z given xi minus 1 claim is that this guy equals to the conditional expectation of something given xy oh, maybe I'll make some more space for myself notice that something make it a little bit cleaner so that's the conditional expectation of z given all the past and all the future okay. so if you look at this conditional expectation then uh, this these two are equal that's somewhat that's that's a result it's a little bit it looks a little bit complicated so this part here let's let's think of let's think about this result we'll prove it now but let's just quickly visualize it we are viewing this function z as a function of three parts this part this is the first part then this part this is the second part and what is the third part and third part is xi that's the third part so this z is a function of three parts and we are conditioning on two of them and then uh, in the outside part we are taking another, another two parts the the part the red part xi minus one and the blue part xi and this blue part is missing from this first expectation and the claim is that when you do that only the first part is left that's the claim so that's roughly what you would like to prove so prove it suffices to show uh, z for so for z equal to function of three parts a b c where a b c are independent independent the expected value this outer part here of let me get the inner part first expected value of z given a c first part and the third part conditional expectation of this given a b you would like to claim is equal to the expected value of just the common part is left here z given a that's what you would like to show and this is almost surely huh, with probability one so how do we show this claim this is what we have to show it's equivalent to what we have written here yeah this is just some simply this is just some simplification that we are trying to get for expression of delta i it looks a little bit uh, of a degradation right now but we'll see soon connected to this expression for variance all right so coming back to this claim how do we show this uh, well, this thing here is a function of a and c and therefore, therefore, yeah, and therefore, uh, when we condition on both a and b, This is independent of b okay so function of ac condition on both a and b it is independent of b so we agree with that part so note that expected value of this is a function of a comma c And therefore, it is independent of B, even when given, given condition on A. So even when you give A, this is independent of B, because A, C jointly are independent of B. So we use this so this implies that the expected value of z given ac 
conditional expectation given a b is exactly equal to this is from the independence condition that given a c given a okay and now this is the familiar formula that we have seen earlier this is conditioning on more and then conditioning on a part of it so that's just the common part remains okay that's the claim here so not much of a difficult proof, but it's an interesting observation. So what, what this tells us is the following. So continuing from before, let's go back to our expression for delta i. Delta i, which was conditional expectation of z given x i minus conditional expectation of z given x i minus 1 can be written as conditional expectation of z given x i minus the conditional expectation of z given everything but the ith part so i'll abbreviate this by minus i okay i'll, I'll write it this way given x i that's what the previous claim was showing where this guy is everything but the ith part x1 to x i minus 1 and x i plus 1 to x n okay that's what this this vector is and this is just this claim this is just this claim above that these two are equal and so the interesting thing about this is that the, the outer expectation is same for both of them the first term and the second term so this can be written as the expected value of z minus the conditional expectation of z given x minus i given x i that's what delta i is therefore the expected value of delta i square is equal to the expected value of this conditional expectation square so conditional expectation of z given z minus given x minus i and then outside x i whole square now we use another inequality which which is a uh, which is also very useful i'll review it and this is what is called jensen's inequality Okay. actually in this case in this case we don't know what we don't need the most general one but what this inequality says is that uh, the expected value of a convex function like square is less than equal to the so, so this is the expected value square this is less than equal to uh, the expected value of the square that's what Jensen's inequality says. So maybe I'll note it down later. But this is by Jensen's inequality. It's in fact a conditional version of Jensen's inequality. That this is less than or equal to expected value of. So I'll take the square inside. And now this is the expected value of expected value. So that's the formula we've seen earlier. So this is just a single expectation of Z minus conditional expectation of Z minus X minus I whole square. Okay. So that's, that's an important observation. And here in this inequality here, we have used the conditional Jensen's inequality. Let me quickly review this inequality. So this applies for any uh, any let's say convex function. So convex function let's say g. Uh, what's a convex function? So here we have g of theta one x one. Let's say theta x one. Theta is something between zero and one. 
plus 1 minus theta x2 so your two points x1 and x2 and what is this? this this thing is a straight line joining them and a convex function is the one for which the value of the function at any point on this line is below the average of the values okay. this kind of function the value of the average that's here is below the average of the value which will be in this line Okay, that's a convex function and if you since this theta is between 0 and 1 you can think of this as g of so this is sometimes called Jensen's inequality it's almost like the definition of convex function it says that g of expected value of x for a convex function is less than or equal to expected value of g of x and it's conditional version instead of expected value has conditional expected value so g of expected value of x given y is less than equal to expected value of gx given y okay and now this is a random variable this inequality ho must hold with some probability and we claim that this holds with probability one so it holds almost surely that's what conditional Jensen's inequality is so the function that we are looking at here this is the conditional expectation and the function that we are looking looking here looking at here is the square function and what this says is that if you take the conditional expectation outside or if you take the square inside the because square is a convex function thing can only increase so we take the square inside the conditional expectation outside and it only increases and this is equal to this Another way is that this is the conditional mean square and this is the second moment of this random variable under condition on xi and second moment is greater than the conditional mean square. This is just like non-negativity of conditional variance of this random this random variable. Okay. So now let's quickly see quickly review what all we have seen. So we had this z uh, z minus ez and we decompose into this uncorrelated component zero mean uncorrelated component delta i. And therefore, the variance of z was expect sum of expected value of this second moment because there was zero mean. Then, after that, we notice that in fact each of this delta i can be expressed as uh, as expected value of some centered random variable where the condition where the, where the centering mean is when condition on x minus i. So we use Jensen's and we got this form. So combining everything, combining everything, what we get is. upon combining all our bounds the way conditional Jensen's is the only inequality we have used till now everything else was exact equality the variance of not the variance sorry yeah sorry variance of this random variable z is less than equal to summation i equal to 1 to n expected value of of this guy okay and in fact i'll do conditioning on xi x minus i here and express this expected value in a slightly different way expected value of z minus conditional expectation of z given everything else so you're fixing everything else but the ith coordinate and taking the square and you take conditional expectation with respect to that and then you take another outside, outside conditional expectation. So we will abbreviate this guy, this thing here. So here we are looking at the probability space. We have condition where we have conditioned everything but the ith guy. We will abbreviate this by this bracket i. So this is the variance of this random variable z when you have conditioned everything but the ith coordinate, and that's what we are denoting by this i. So it's a random variable here. And what we have shown, this is the first form of Alfred-Stein inequality that this variance of random variable z is less than equal to summation i equal to 1 to n expected value 
of these conditional variances, variance of i given z, right? That's that's roughly that's what our main claim is. This is the Efferenstein inequality that we have shown. Now, note that this, this is, uh, just to reiterate, this is the conditional variance of the random variable z when you condition on all but the ith coordinate. So it's like the fluctuation in the ith coordinate. You fix everything else and only allowing ith coordinate to vary. And when you do that, then you get this conditional variance. And this variance is sort of less than equal to the variance or the fluctuation contributed by the individual coordinates. That's the claim of efference and inequality. Now, what we will do is we will uh, will give provide other equivalent forms of this inequality. Okay. So this is the main form. You can stay at it for some time, and now we'll provide some other equivalent form of this inequality. Equivalent forms of the Afrin. inequality and these equivalent forms are simply obtained by writing equivalent expression for variances so first observation this is just a fact that you can verify I'll give a homework exercise to verify this if you have a random variable X and a copy Y of it so for independent and identically distributed random variables x and y variance of x is equal to half of expected value of x minus y square that's a claim okay so that's something you can try to show Actually, we can just show it. Let's just show it, okay? Let me not leave it as a homework exercise. So this is proof of this fact. Expected value of x minus y square is equal to expected value of x square plus expected value of y square minus two times expected value of x minus expected value of y. So this is an independent copy, but x and y are identically distributed. So this becomes two times expected value of x square minus expected value of x whole square. And this is equal to two times the variance of x. Okay, so that's a very simple treatment. So if we use this proof here uh, and we will substitute this in this inner variance, what is this inner variance? We have fixed everything, all the entries except the ith entry. Okay. And now we would like to replace ith entry with its independent copy. How do we do that? So we will have a notation for that. Let z i prime be f of x1 to x i minus 1 so that those those entries are fixed to x1 to xi minus 1 except that the ith entry is replaced by its independent copy so all the other entries of this random variable these of this function all the other arguments of this functions are fixed as before x1 to xi minus 1 xi1 plus xn except the ith entry is flipped is replaced with an independent copy so where x1 prime to x n prime is an independent copy of independent copy of um, x1 to x So then, so the zi prime is, is an independent copy of, so zi prime is an independent copy of z when you condition on everything else. And by the previous fact, 
you look at the variance given i of z this is exactly equal to half into the expected value of z minus zi prime square of course given all all, all but the ith entry so x minus i okay these two are equal this is just by this fact here and when we plug this into a first form of Efferenstein, we get the second form of Efferenstein inequality. It says that variance of z is less than or equal to half summation i equal to 1 to n expected value of z minus z i prime whole square. Looks pretty neat. So these different forms may have different applications. Where remember z i prime is obtained by replacing z i prime is just like z except that the arguments are the ith coordinate of the argument x1 to xn is replaced with its independent copy x i prime that's what z i prime is okay that's the first uh, that's the first equivalent that's the first equivalent form well let me number them so this is form one reference and inequality and this is form 2 and now finally I'll give you another form uh, this the, the final form will again be obtained by using an alternative expression for variance I'll also put this as a fact many of you may already be aware of this fact so suppose You have this random variable x, variance of x is something you are looking at. This is actually the minimum mean square error for all square integrable functions. So this variance of x is minimum over all uh, x prime of expected value of x minus x prime okay where the minimum is over all square integrable basically the ones with finite second moment x prime independent of x so you can take a random variable independent of x and take minimum of this mean square error cost we are looking for independent random variable that best approximates x in fact this is obtained by the mean of x a constant random variable is the best one here that's what that's a result you can show in fact you can show it by just differentiating if you like but uh, yeah, there are many ways of showing this actually a uh, more formal proof you will do some completion of square but this is something you may be aware of for us we are looking for and the random variable x we are interested in is this guy which is this random variable z condition on all the other x i minus one uh, so there what you have this x prime it's not independent it's a it's a random function of x1 to uh, x i minus 1 and x i plus 1 to x n and you minimize this guy over all such random functions so for us this gives this is some fact that we recall for us this gives variance over i of x this is given all the other guys So this is a randomized value when everything else is fixed, right? And therefore this is minimum over all z prime i random variable independent of uh, x i given everything else given 
x i minus 1 and x i plus 1 to n that's that's what's fixed here okay As such that expected value of z i prime square is finite right so, so this is uh, true this is true almost surely because yeah this is what what i mean by almost surely is over all realization of x i minus 1 and x i plus 1 to n and we have an expectation outside so we can just view this z i prime as a randomized function of these guys and we can write the third form variance of a random variable z is less than equal to summation i equal to 1 to n minimum over all functions z i prime where z i prime is equal to g of x minus i some function in fact a randomized function is also allowed such that expected value of z i prime square is finite okay, minimum over all such functions expected value and, and this function this can divide depend on i so i'm putting an i here of z minus z i prime whole square I'm using a similar notation as this case here. Here there's the half, there's no half here. Okay, that's that's the third form. This third form is also very handy because this is less than the minimum one. You can substitute your favorite function and get another form. These three forms are equivalent, none is stronger than the other. But let's just uh, weaken this third form and you and note an important corollary as a corollary using so I can define any function here g i of x minus i is equal to we can we would like to define a function here so that for each coordinate for each coordinate we get that uh, value ci that we had seen earlier that's what we would like to do so what is that function z i how would we like to define that function z i so that function can be defined as half of inf over it's the average of max and min over this coordinate let's say x i now you have f of you fix everything else x minus i take min in over this guy x i plus 1 to n plus soup over x i f of x minus i x i x i plus 1 to n so you can define this function this way and since this is min or inf over all such functions this function is a specific choice I should I should have written in here I'm being a, being a little bit casual by saying min that's all right so if you look at this function what is z minus this function z i prime square so it is it is subtracting the average value from this guy and therefore it cannot be less than it cannot be more than this implies if f satisfies the c1 c2 cn bounded difference property then z minus g i 
x minus 1 x minus i is less than equal to c i square by 4 okay you can check that it's the min of it's the average value that we are subtracting of the two extremes and therefore this is less than equal to this therefore by form 3 of the Afrenstein inequality Afrenstein inequality so this is the form 3 I have put in a specific function this one it has the power of this method you can put in any specific function by the way this is the means minimum mean square error of uh, estimating z by looking at all the other coordinates that's what this guy is by looking at all the other coordinates of xi so looking at x minus i what is the minimum mean square error in estimating minimum mean squared error by in estimating z so now yeah so we have this bound for if the function satisfies the bounded difference property and therefore by form 3 variance of z is less than or equal to 1 by 4 summation i equal to 1 to n c i square uh, which is very much like uh, what we had seen in the Magdiarmid inequality okay so this Afrenstein to conclude this Afrenstein inequality gives a similar bound for the variance of z itself instead of the variance factor okay. uh, this is what I wanted to say in this lecture in the next lecture I'll uh, see an application of this Afrenstein inequality to get concentration bounds for self for for this uh, function satisfying bounded difference property just like make the argument we can get another concentration bound but before i close just a quick review we saw three different forms of Afrenstein inequality the first one is this one where we have decomposed this variance into variance along individual coordinates when you change when you fix all the other coordinates but only allow individual ith coordinate to move that's this variance i then equivalently we saw that uh, we can write uh, an independent copy z i prime uh, obtained by replacing the ith coordinate of x ith coordinate of f uh, of domain of f of input of f uh, with its independent copy and that's what you get here and then we use the mmsc expression minimum mean square error expression for variance to get another form where the minimum is over all functions of the coordinates x minus i and you are trying to estimate this z under mean square error this is also equivalent to the previous form all these three forms are equivalent Okay, see you in the next lecture.